Video games have been around for nearly five decades. Throughout time, they have evolved from humble beginnings in the archaic 1970s to the uncanny 4K resolution we see today. This revolutionary form of media has a long history attached to it, with trials and tribulations in abundance. Many people's entire childhood revolve around the video games they had as a kid, and there are some whose entire careers are founded entirely upon this abstract form of entertainment. People have gone as far as to teach the art of video game development as a college course. Many times in the timeline of home entertainment, video games can easily become a small footnote in the harsh entertainment industry. Despite the odds stacked against them, they've continued to adapt to the future, inventing new ways to entertain and engage us. Video games were, and still are, very important. Time and time again, they've broken the demanding home entertainment barriers throughout history, persevering through the market and climbing to the top of the food chain. The 1970s was an era of baby steps for video games. The hardware at the time was highly limited, and nobody really figured out how games should be made. This, along with the many, many platforms that companies give developers, proved video games to be very difficult to develop. There wasn't a guide on how to make a good game like there is today. Thus, there was a lot of experimentation. Take, for instance, the controller design of the consoles of the era. Most people consider Atari to have the best controller, but even that was limited, as there was one button and a stick to work with. Competitors didn't move ahead any more than Atari, however, such as the Intellivated controller, which features a numpad. However, at the time, most people didn't look at home consoles like we do today. No, they looked at them as mini arcade machines. It wasn't uncommon to see Donkey Kong or Pac-Man on the Atari, since it was made with the idea to play arcade games at home. However, not every game from that era was terrible. Some of them are remembered by gamers today as great games. Take, for example, Breakout, a game designed for the Atari. Created by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the game is an absolute classic. The concept of the game is very simple. You control a paddle that hits a ball. There is a layer of colored bricks above you, and your goal is to destroy all the bricks without the ball falling into the pit below you. It may seem boring at first glance, but in reality it was a fun game that anybody could have picked up and played. Even if the gameplay itself is rather mundane, What's important is its role as a gateway to more complex games, such as Pitfall or Dig Dug. In the history of gaming, the 1980s began with darkness. In 1983, the video game market crashed, and gaming consoles worldwide took a dump in sales. The market was oversaturated with too many consoles and low-quality games. In many eyes, the market was dead, and it seemed as if the careers for many developers and companies were over. However, when the smoke cleared and when the dust settled, two new contenders rose to revive the industry, Nintendo and Sega. With these two companies fiercely competing, sales were booming was more, and the market was alive. In 1988, Time Magazine published an article called Nintendo Score is Big, which is about Nintendo's console sales booming. The Nintendo Entertainment System had a large catalog of games, ranging from platforms to shoot 'em up. The NES was a humongous upgrade in the design of home entertainment consoles as a whole. There was a new controller with a revolutionary feature called the D-pad. Resembling a cross or a plus, it allowed for movement in four directions, and it was accompanied by an A and a B button, as well as a start and a select button. Design. It was both the ease of use of the controller and the freedom it gave developers. Combined with some all-time classics such as Super Mario Bros., Metroid, Castlevania, The Legend of Zelda, and Excitebike, you have a system to be remembered. While Sega did have an 8-bit console, called the Sega Master System, it looked paled in comparison to the NES in sales. To arrive with Nintendo, Sega struck back hard with a system called the Sega Genesis. The graphics were better than the NES's, the cartridges had more memory, the controller had three buttons, it was more powerful, and it came with its own timeless classics, such as Sonic the Hedgehog, Golden Axe, Ultra Beast, Streets of Rage, Shinobi, and Kid Chameleon. But Sega mainly focused on its marketing was its 16-bit graphics card and its blast processing later on in the Genesis's lifespan. Sega's most famous commercial is what has been dubbed the Genesis Duds commercial, which really sold kids on the console. Genesis Duds! 16-bit arcade graphics. Get 
Joe Montana free, Pat Riley free, Buster Douglas free, Super Monaco GP free, or Collins free. What Nintendo? Buy a 16-bit Genesis system between now and October 31st and get an extra game. Competition was fierce between the two companies, which is why video games have continued to evolve and innovate over the decades. They've continuously had to come up with new and interesting ideas. For instance, The Legend of Zelda had a save system, whereas most games use a password system to save progress, which you'd have to write down to remember. Sonic and Knuckles is another game notorious for having two separate storylines, each one with its own gameplay gimmicks and mechanics. It is really truly amazing just how these companies strive to be greater than the other, which forced them to innovate and find new ways to achieve greatness. Mega Man 2 is another excellent example of innovation. You had to fight eight robot masters, but you had a choice in which ones to fight. It was obviously a preferred order on how to fight them, but you gained a boss's ability and defeated them. For instance, you beat Bubble Man, you take his ability to lead bubble, which you could then take to Heat Man, who was weak to the bubbles. The 1980s was overall an era where games got their footing and began to take form. The 1990s was really a great era for gaming, as there was a lot of progression during this time period. From the start of the decade to the end of it, there was no shortage of innovation. A prominent debate in this decade is what we refer to as the Bit Wars, wherein bits of the graphics quality of the game. It is undeniable that in the 80s, Sega had a clear upper hand over Nintendo in terms of graphics. However, in November of 1990, Nintendo gave their answer to the Genesis, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Right off the bat, the SNES had 8 times the RAM the NES had, which was upgraded to 128 kilobytes. On top of that, the improved console allowed for 32,758 colors on screen, versus the 52 the NES allowed, and that's nearly 630 times the colors. With the NES allowed for 8x16 sprites, the SNES allowed for 64x64 sprites. The resolution increase, the amount of video RAM increased, the system could utilize samples and MIDI files, and everything overall jumped up in quality. Sega didn't change the Sega Genesis, and instead they came out with the Sega CD, which was a flop. That isn't to say CDs weren't an important part of the 1990s. On top of the general hardware improvements, the SNES improved the controller design too. The controller had four buttons instead of two, a nice round edge to place your hand, a start and select button, and a welcome new addition of shoulder buttons, which was a first for the gaming industry. The controller is considered to have one of the best controller designs in existence, with companies still using its four button layout to this day. Innovation, as we previously discussed, is common in the 90s. Game designers like to experiment with new designs and styles. This experimentation created new games the likes of which people had never seen before. One of these genres would be first-person shooters, which was something completely new to people. Games like Doom, Quake, and Wolfenstein 3D were the first of the time. In the same vein, for polygonal games, you had Goldmine 007, Doom 64, Perfect Dark, Half-Life, Team Fortress Classic, Data Feet, and Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, all of which are classics. The Nintendo 64 was a good console, but the controller was weird. It had a three-pronged design with a brittle stick and an awkward button placement. To make matters worse, it used cartridges, which made the console an overall pain to design games on. The 3D console of the 90s that people remember was now, however, the N64. No, no, it's a new competitor. One that has dominated the console wars ever since its inception, Sony's PlayStation. The console did a number of things right. As I foreshadowed, CDs didn't really go to waste in the 90s. The PlayStation used CDs, which held a wild amount of memory in them, was able to display 3D graphics in the form of polygons, and held a library of very solid third-party games. Hey, uh, Editing Salty here. I forgot to mention something. So, the PlayStation 1 didn't bring back the C-Stick, the analog stick. The N64 did that, and they made an update to the analog stick. Uh, I guess it's called the DualShock. Um, DualShock 1. You can see in the image here is the OG like PlayStation controller. I just wanted to say that and not, you know, be a little troll and spread misinformation across the internet. Thanks. These are all series that, importantly, weren't on the N64, and raked in money for Sony. However, Sony's new controller, the DualShock, really rocked people's worlds. It had a four-button layout and a D-pad, which was pretty standard by this point. However, it also had two sets of shoulder buttons, and most importantly, it brought back sticks. There were two in the controller, and they felt great to handle. It also had handles for the player to hold on to, and honestly, it really just melts into the hands. The 1990s was, as previously discussed, 
a very important time in the history of games. It really opened the game industry to the general public and allowed for companies to prosper. The history of home entertainment has had a lot of big games in its history. A few are like the titan we know today as video games. In the 80s, the market crashed, and it seemed as though the industry was dead. At least, that was until Nintendo and Sega rose from the ashes. It was here that things started to evolve, and thanks to the everlasting battle between the two companies to be better than the other. In the 90s, designers started to experiment with new ideas and concepts, driven by competition and the horizon of new technology. It was here that modern games and unique genres started to take form from beginning to end. In conclusion, games have always had to break barriers because it was mandatory for their survival. 